And Madhusa, thanks so much for the invite. I'm really excited to talk to you uh, primarily about my postdoctoral work and a little bit of what we are uh, getting started in my lab, uh, which I started just uh, three months ago. Okay, great. Um, and I'm really feel I, I don't have a way to monitor the chat here. So, but feel free to just uh, interrupt during the seminar if you have any questions. Or uh, happy to discuss at the end of and end of the seminar as well. Yeah, um, I on the chat here as well. Great. Uh, sounds good. Okay, so I, I want to begin by really drawing your attention to one of the most uh, fundamental biological processes uh, that is embryonic development. I think it's quite remarkable and in, in many ways very enigmatic that a single cell can go through a series of differentiation steps where it's going through divisions and series of specializations to give really give rise to a very complex uh, a multicellular uh, organism. And then this process of differentiation where the cells are dividing and acquiring new traits continues even in the adult differentiation, uh, in the adult uh, animals because there are constant renewal of many systems. For example, our immune system is constantly renewed, our skin, et cetera, even the gut systems, they're constantly renewed. So there is this ongoing process of some kind of a stem cell giving rise to a lot of differentiated uh, cells which have very specialized uh, functions. So in think of this, one way to really abstract this entire process, either development or differentiation, is to view this process as a series of lineage decisions where a progenitor cell type, that means it's a cell type or a state which can give rise to multiple different uh, cell types. Uh, so a progenitor can give rise to different uh, lineages. So even though this is a very simple abstraction, this becomes very powerful. But then the next question is how to represent what the current state of any given cell or what the state is. And we can again use an abstraction saying the gene expression profile, that is in effect, what are the collection of genes that are expressed and to what levels they're expressed are in effect that defines what is the features uh, set of the cell and that we use to represent the cell state. With that abstraction, then we can study, really go into mechanisms of how these lineage decisions are happening. And uh, at a gross level, we can really think of it as two very uh, different modes in which a cell decides to take one fate or the another. So one way is to look at cell autonomous mechanisms where uh, the control of these systems is inherent property of the cell itself. This comes through regulatory networks. Uh, and the second is through non-autonomous or cell communication mechanisms where cells in individual neighborhoods or niches are uh, communicating with each other and responding to these signals as they acquire one state or the other. Now, given this abstraction, then the next question becomes, uh, how do we measure cell state? We, I mentioned gene expression can be used as a proxy to measure, measure cell state. And there's been a huge, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar, that there are lots of technologies which allow us to really get a robust and reliable measure of the cell states. And one such technology, as I'm sure you're familiar, is bulk rna where the goal is take a bunch of cells, essentially grind them up, and then extract all the mRNA that is present in this, in this group of cells and sequence them to get effectively a expression profile in that sample. Now, I'm, uh, this is a bit of an overused, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a representation, but, but really the, because it's grinding up a lot of cells and tissues, in effect, this becomes what is like a smoothie, right? So we do not know the individual constituents, but we just know what is this bulk floating uh, or uh, what's happening in the bulk. Uh, but, but more recently, I think about a few years ago, uh, there is new technological advance where we can really measure RNA-seq profile of every individual uh, cell. And, and this is quite remarkable because uh, again, as you're mostly familiar, it, this technology really took off, uh, let's say about five or six years ago. And in even this short span, there's been a huge amount of data that's being generated. So, um, and, and this is just through one project, but really there's millions of cells, which provides us a fantastic opportunity to revisit some of the more fundamental biological uh, processes. 
Um, and I was just mentioning that single cell RNA-seq, even though it gives us this amazing scale and resolution, is extremely noisy in nature. But despite the noise, we have been able to make some cl critical advances about how the system behaves. So here, as a simple abstract, a simple representation of human hematopoiesis, we have CD34 stem and progenitor cells, which give rise to, let's say, as a simplification, just these three cell types. Now, if we zoom in into, uh, and, and this was really already well known, this is one based on expression of one marker, but then you can, this can really be opened up into multiple different uh, cell types or cell states going through different progenitor cells until we reach uh, these, uh, let's say, more mature functionally differentiated cell types. But, and, and, and the classical view has always been, this is a very discrete step. HSC becomes MPP, then that becomes uh, these particular cell types and so on. Now, when we looked at CD34 positive hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells and perform single cell RNA-seq, what we saw is that this actually is a very continuous process. And uh, this is a Disney plot here, each dot represents a cell. And this 2D plot is just a, uh, uh, as a 2D representation of how the cellular relationships are in this high dimensional gene expression space. And each dot is colored based on a cell type we annotated based on the expression of particular uh, sets of genes. So that's why we can say we have the stem and progenitor cells, and, uh, stem cells here, and that differentiates to the different cell types. And, and, and the key point here is, uh, kind of going against the grain of the classical view, it's not, uh, it, it, the data seems to suggest the system doesn't go through the series of bifurcation steps, but it's actually a continuous cell state transitions in this system. And, and this has been true across many, many systems uh, uh, repeatedly, uh, which has been observed repeatedly. And, and given this cell state transitions, continuous nature of the cell state transitions, uh, we can then look at uh, what are the gene expression trends or how does individual genes behave and change across the different uh, lineages uh, and really making single cell RNA-seq really particularly ideally suitable for modeling differentiation and developmental trajectory. Just to kind of quickly summarize uh, what we were talking about. So uh, we can really use single cell RNA-seq as a very powerful technique uh, to be able to uh, model lineage decisions because it provides us the scale and the resolutions. But despite the noise, uh, we can over, even though the data is very noisy, we can overcome the noise to make very fundamental uh, discoveries. All right. So with that, well, we have lost quite a bit of time. So, but uh, I, I, I would like to really focus mostly on one of the first part of the talk I was uh, hoping to give. It is Palantir, which is an algorithm we developed. Uh, it's been published for a while now, but it really models the continuities in cell state and cell fate uh, choices. All right. Um, so just to kind of, so that we are all on the same page, uh, the goal of what we call as trajectory detection algorithms or uh, modeling developmental progression is really to start with a profile of single cell RNA-seq of a system that is representative of a differentiating system. And then assuming uh, in this case that we know approximately what the profile of a start cell is, the goal is to order these cell cells along a pseudo time order or uh, an ordering that does represent the developmental uh, progression. Now this, in all honesty, is one of the most well studied, uh, uh, most highly studied uh, let's say aspects in the field of single cell uh, computational biology. And there's been a huge number of algorithms that have been published uh, to take the single cell RNA seq data and order them along their trajectories. Uh, but, but invariably, most of the algorithms really treated these uh, 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 trajectories as a series of discrete bifurcation steps where one cell type gives rise to, let's say, another cell type, and so on as a series of bifurcation. Um, but what the data suggested and what our data showed uh, across systems, and as you can see across organisms, is that 
there is no one point where a cell decides to be one uh, cell type or the other. In fact, the lineage decision process where the cells are acquiring different traits, then cells tend to be very continuous in nature. So how do we model this, right? So if, if a cell, if there is no point where the cell says I'll become A or B, can we really then compute what's the probability, right? Rather than see, viewing this process as a series of bifurcations, can we for each cell compute what's the probability of a cell reaching the different terminal phase? So that really is the goal of our algorithm where we can really model the continuities in not only cell state transitions, which have been very uh, demonstrated in a very pronounced manner with single cell RNA-seq, but also model these continuities in cell fate uh, choices. Okay, so uh, I, I now wanna go in a bit of technical detail about uh, uh, this algorithm. And one of the most important aspects of uh, any kind of development trajectory or any kind of progression is that the gene to gene relationships tend to be highly nonlinear in nature. So I'm sure what I'm showing you here is expression of two genes, uh, which is known to be important for this particular uh, trajectory. Uh, each dot is a cell and the cell is colored by where exactly is it on this progression. Blue means it's an early state, red means it's a late state. And as you can see, it's very, the relationship between these two genes is highly uh, nonlinear, right? So you have GATA1, GATA, both going up first, and then this GATA2, that gene in the x-axis, tends to go down or reduce in expression as cells move forward in progression. And therefore, uh, in order to be, in order to accurately capture this nonlinear relationship, we use nearest neighbor graphs to describe the cellular phenotypic space itself. Um, this again is quite simple. So the, uh, for any cell, we connect each of its uh, or each cell to its k nearest neighbors, and then given that we know uh, the property of the graph here, we can just take steps through the graph to measure distances between cells. And because we know what the identity of the start cell is, we can compute shortest part distances from this predefined start cell to compute uh, what's the developmental progression. That means we have effectively a unified uh, pseudo time order across all the cells of the system. Okay, great. Now, uh, now this is effectively just a one dimensional representation of the progression and it doesn't really inform anything about the lineage decisions. And, and, and I'm gonna describe how we do this next. Okay, so, so we started with the nearest neighbor graph, right? And then this by definition is undirected because even though each, we just connect each cell to its K nearest neighbors, it doesn't implicitly encode any directionality about the, de uh, about the developmental progression. But what we do have is access to the pseudo time order, which represents the developmental progression. Therefore, we can now reorient our undirected graph in a way to be consistent with the pseudo time order to de derive a directed graph representing the differentiation uh, system. Uh, once we have the directed graph, we can then uh, convert the distances to affinities, normalize them, and model the differentiation process itself as a Markov chain. And, and, and this really is the entire, um, let's say, the heart and the, the key concept behind Palantir that we can use uh, or we can model the differentiation process as a Markov chain. And when we do that, we can leverage the properties of these Markov chains to describe the differentiation system. And, and one such property of course is uh, the stationary distribution from which uh, of this Markov chain from which we can automatically infer the terminal states, reducing the amount of prior biological knowledge that we need to describe the system. All right. Um, now, once we have the terminal states, we can remove all the outgoing edges from the terminal states and define an absorbing Markov chain. That means any path that reaches the absorbing states terminates there, and each of these paths is associated with the path probability. Now, uh, now therefore, then the, the goal of 
computing what's the probability of any cell reaching a particular terminal state is uh, reduces to the the problem of computing all possible random walks from one cell or that particular cell to that uh, to the uh, terminal cell of interest and that is a summary of the lineage probability itself and, and the nice thing is all of basically all the probabilities of for any cell to any terminal states can be computed with a very nice uh, closed form solution giving us a comprehensive picture of the continuities in cell fate uh, choices and and just to kind of give you an example if i'm looking at so this is a system where this is the start and these are the terminals we identified three terminals here a b and c and if you look at cells which are right at the beginning of the trajectory we have non zero probability of reaching all the different terminal states as you would expect and and as things progress right so this cell number 2 which is highlighted here is more biased towards the red lineage and it's gradually losing um, ability to differentiate to the other lineages and, and and the really nice thing here is because each of these probabilities is just a multinomial distribution we can quantify what's the uncertainty or what's the information content in them uh, through just quantifying them through entropy and this we nominate to represent the differentiation potential of the cell or a measure of the plasticity of the cell and as you can see cells at the beginning of the trajectory tend to have high differentiation potential and this gradually drops down as cells acquire particular fates and commit to particular uh, lineages all right so as a summary uh, uh, of the algorithm we started with a series of single cell profiles or single cell rna seq data of representing a particular differentiating system uh, uh, and we we assume that we know the start cell and uh, more recently we have developed uh, approaches where we don't need to know the start cell but then uh, using this information we first derive a pseudo time order uh, and then for each of the cells, we can also compute what's the probability of any given cell reaching the different terminal states. And using that, we compute the differentiation potential or a measure of plasticity of the cells as well. Um, so I just wanted to pause here to check if there were questions. Um, I can have a quick one. I was uh -huh. going to ask how you choose the, first, the uh, starting cell by your kind of answered, <laughs> but how do, how does the differentiation, differentiation potential behaves for the, the cell types which are known, for example, the committed cell types, uh -huh. how, is it really goes to zero towards how, I mean, how does it differentiate between the in, uh, intermediate? Right. No, that's a great question. Uh, so I'll answer the second part first. So one of the things is uh, because of the way we have defined this, uh, uh, this the potential does go to zero, but that's assuming that the cells we have measured is a complete representation of the system, right? So, I mean, if we look at only, let's say in this case, CD34 positive, that means we are not really looking at the very end of the differentiation because uh, we just didn't measure it. But we assume that uh, uh, potential of zero doesn't necessarily mean it's an absolute zero, but it's more that within the system of the cells we have measured, there is no other, uh, there is no probability of the cells differentiating to other systems, uh, other cell types. Um, does that make sense? Um, yeah. yeah, so it is just, we assume that we have a complete description, uh, but yeah, as you can see, uh, there, there is a chance that the cells will leave this manifold, right? Because we haven't measured that yet, but we assume that the cells are staying within the manifold and that's that's where the potential does go to zero in this case yeah thanks right and, and in terms of the start cell yeah so in this uh, approach uh, we uh, the way to choose is based on no expression of some known markers right so in uh, i know okay we know based on prior biological knowledge this as the set of genes that a start cell has to express so it needs to be really, it doesn't have to be exact, just an approximation of where the start cell is in this bunch of cells, and it can correct for the right uh, start cell. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, were there any more questions? All right. So, so in are my slides advancing? Just want to check. Yep. Okay. Great. So in the next part, I just wanted to briefly uh, uh, give an example of uh, uh, how we use uh, these algorithms uh, to be able to study mouse endoderm development and characterize lineage decisions uh, during mouse embryonic development. All right, great. So uh, our goal here was really to study uh, the embryonic development with a specific focus on the endoderm. So we generate in a close collaboration with the Harjan Tonakis lab in the DevBio program at SKI. We generated a large scale uh, single cell RNA-seq data set uh, with a specific focus on the endoderm lineages. Um, we validated that looking at individual time points, uh, we measured this at one day intervals and looking at individual time points, we were able to uh, confirm that we recovered all the known cell types of the system. But one of the challenges uh, here, because the data set was really measured at very discrete uh, time points, is that a progression, right? So from three and a half, this is E three and a half, just means it's three and a half days of uh, embryonic day three and a half, and then you have four and a half. So the difference between time points is now a mix of true progression, right? Because the embryo is developing, but also there are batch effects between them. Now, an issue uh, if we apply just global batch correction is that it completely destroys the structure. And that's because the, the, these methods, um, and it's not a criticism, it's just by design, assume that the difference between any two samples that we are applying correction for tends to be highly, uh, it's purely technical and not necessarily uh, biological. And, and therefore we wanted to develop an algorithm that or a procedure, let's say, that can connect the cells across uh, time points, uh, but retain where the differences are a mix of true biology and some technical uh, noise. All right. So for this, uh, we kind of take advantage of the fact that even though we are measuring our, uh, things at very discrete time points, there is asynchrony of cells within each time point. That means if we have, let's say, a time point T, we have a bunch of cells which are more, which are closer to T plus one. And at T plus one, we have a bunch of cells which are close to T because things are not completely synchronized because here we are taking a bunch of, we are really using a pool of embryos. Therefore, our goal was we can, how do we identify these cells which are more close to the next or previous time point and, and the approach we took here was to identify mutually nearest neighbors between time point T and time point uh, T plus one. Uh, and just to, uh, I'm gonna skip past this, but the idea here was if we just construct a nearest neighbor uh, graph across all the cells, we'll not see any uh, edges that span across time points. So what I'm showing you here is just an adjacency matrix. Each row and each column is a cell. Blue, left, blue means these are nearest neighbors and white means they are not nearest neighbors. And, and as you can see, uh, the edges of cells at E6.5 tends to stay within 6.5, whereas edges of cells within 7.5 tends to stay within 7.5. But what we can do is now compute, instead of just nearest neighbors, compute mutually nearest neighbors between six and a half and seven and a half and augment this um, adjacency matrix using this nearest neighbors, essentially drawing the cells from the two time points uh, together. All right. And once we do this, we get this really nice structure where we can uh, connect the various time points and we see this kind of convergence of the cells between these two major lineages uh, at the 8.75 cell type or uh, time point. And this again was completely uh, consistent and uh, with the recovery of the known uh, biology. Um, so, uh, 
So I just want to check again if there were any questions here because this is a simple approach, but I, it turned out to be very powerful because we have things which are measured at very discrete time points and without being able to connect them uh, in a in a clear manner, we wouldn't be able to describe the biological uh, system. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and and here I just wanted to give you an example of uh, how uh, we use this to find a new dis a new um, uh, lineage transitions in the biological system. So here I first want to start with uh, the first two time points: uh, embryonic day three and a half and embryonic day four and a half, which are the pre-implantation stages of the embryo. And, and what I'm showing you here is on the left, it's again a T-SME map. Um, each cell is now colored by the measured time point. Uh, red is in three and a half, a uh, gold is four and a half. And on the right, I have colored the cells by their uh, annotated cell types, uh, which are uh, just basically based on the gene expression profile of, of uh, gene ex genes that are expressed in these uh, cells, right? And, and as a simple example, when we applied Palantir, we see, of course, we know this is the star that's known based on biology, and there is progression. Uh, this is pseudo time progression starting from ICM, and the cells end up either being epiblast or the primitive endoderm. Uh, and we can also compute these branch probabilities. Uh, we can see the cells biasing towards the epiblast here and the cells biasing towards the primitive endoderm here. And, and, and uh, kind of going back to the question, even though the differentiation potential is zero here, these cells do progress forward, but we are only describing the system among the cells we chose in here. And, and the nice thing is now, if we look at the differentiation potential, we can really pinpoint to say, this is a point along the trajectory where the cells are, are either deciding to go towards the epiblast or the primitive endoderm lineage, but it's not again a bifurcation event, but there is some plasticity or uh, the fact that the, it is a continuous process associated with these probabilities, okay? Now, um, what I want to do next is just add on uh, another additional set of cells, uh, which is from embryonic day five and a half, to the same data set. And this is a new structure we see. So we still have three and a half cells here. We have four and a half cells here. And then five and a half cells are in green at this point. And, and what's quite interesting here, and this is really pure visualization, that there might be a stream of cells that connect between the two lineages, which we saw to be completely separated at uh, embryonic day four and a half. And and this was interesting because uh, this suggests maybe a possible trans differentiation, but uh, nothing of uh, nothing of this sort has been observed or described before um, in the system. Uh, therefore, we applied Palantir again. And uh, what was very interesting is we found this small set of cells, which you can see is from the epiblast, which seem to have an increase in differentiation potential. And that means they're associated with um, the epiblast cells, which are in the red here, trans-differentiating to the primitive endoderm cells, which are in blue here. So as a simple description, uh, we started with the ICM. There is a decision of the ICM cells to go towards the epiblast or the primitive endoderm, but at, some, at, at, at the post-implantation stage, it seems, or it appears, we. This is, of course, at this point, a prediction that these epiblast cells, a small group of them, are acquiring this ability to transdifferentiate to the primitive endoderm or the visceral endoderm. Now, this is, of course, just a prediction, but we really undertook very extensive uh, lineage tracing experiments to show that this is indeed the case in mouse embryos. And, and this is an extremely rare event and this trans differentiation, as we predicted, is unidirectional. These are cells that go from the red to the blue lineage. And despite repeating the same experiment in, in the same number of times, 
we ne never saw any in any visceral endoderm cells differentiating to the epiblast cells, really showing that we are able to validate this prediction. And, and, and more importantly, we were able to make this discovery because we modeled uh, the, the lineage decisions as this continuous process uh, using uh, Palantir. Great. So I just want to check, stop, pause here to see if there were uh, any questions at this point as well. Good. Okay. Great. Uh, right. So in the next part, uh, we have yeah maybe I'll I'll quickly go through this. This is some more recent work we have been uh, doing, uh, and and this is to kind of identification to it's a new algorithm we have developed to identify uh, now cell states in single cell RNA and uh, single cell uh, ataxy uh, data. Now. We've been talking about how do we model uh, lineage decisions uh, and cell fate choices from single cell RNA-seq data. And one of the issues, let's say, is we don't have a ground truth of the system. And there have, there have been studies which can measure this ground truth uh, based on cell tagging. Um, without going into detail, but uh, too much detail, uh, these systems effectively provide, okay, what's the probability of a given cell reaching the different terminal states uh, in a very simple system, but this does have a ground truth measure of these probabilities. And, and what the authors found was that despite the single cell rna being extremely informative in many of these lineage decisions, the exact probabilities are the lineage decisions tend to precede what happens, uh, what can be observed with uh, RNA. And using the RNA information alone does not provide sufficient information to get a more very accurate and reliable measure of, uh, of, the, of these probabilities. And, um, and one alternative thing, right, so one alternative mechanisms of how cells are acquiring this uh, cell fate choices is most likely uh, is something we can measure through the mode of regulation. Um, just to kind of uh, simplify, so we have been talking about gene expression, how the gene is expressed or what level the gene is expressed. And, and the key mechanism through which gene is expressed is through binding of different transcription factors on the DNA. So assume that this is a stretch of DNA, uh, there is some sequence signal here, and then there are proteins which bind to these different signals and then they collectively turn on the expression of this gene. And there is this technology called as ATAXI, which really allows us to identify where exactly on the genome is a particular factor bound. Uh, we don't know the identity of the factor, but at least we know where things are, what's called as the open chromatin region, or really where are these elements that turn on the expression of this gene. And I'm gonna skip past this in the interest of time, but the, the really cool thing now is, and this is really just, the technology is just, uh, I think six months old. Now we can measure multiple aspects or both the RNA and this open chromatin region from the same individual cell. Uh, in effect, what we have is from in any individual cell, we can get two independent uh, genome-wide measurements, and we can do this across thousands of cells, providing us with a very high-resolution view of what's going on uh, within the cell and potentially giving us a way to identify what are the mechanisms that might be driving these, uh, driving, uh, these changes as cells differentiate. All right. So uh, again, I'm gonna skip past this, but uh, one of the important aspects here is actually maybe here. Um, the, this type of data, again, tends to be extremely noisy. So what this uh, plot is showing is just where exactly is a transcription factor, any set of transcription factor bound on a gene. So this is a genomic locus uh, of a particular gene. And, and if there is a protein that is bound on the genome, it gives us a way to measure, okay, to what extent is the protein bound and how stable it is. So 
each peak you see is uh, is in effect uh, a protein that's bound on the gene. Now, if we take all of this cluster of cells, you see a nice profile. But if we look at single cells, uh, because we have that resolution, we barely see any signal because the data is extremely uh, noisy. And but but the problem is, if we look at the aggregate profile along the cluster, it really uh, merges or dampens uh, a lot of the signal. For example, if I take this cluster of cells and just break it down into three groups, uh, fairly arbitrarily, but let's say through based on some pseudo time bin, you can see that things do change quite a bit, right? So here, this seems like one peak here or one event, but that shows a lot of uh, dynamics. And, and our goal was to really identify these individual cell states that can help map these dynamics of uh, either the chromatin changes or expression changes to overcome the noise in the data. And, and this has an, uh, uh, the concept of uh, has been around now uh, since last year. The goal is to view these uh, single cell profiles as aggregates of cells that are a result of measurement noise. That means uh, what the formulation is, you have, when you, you measure the system, there are a bunch of uh, states that describe the system and each individual cell is a noisy measurement of uh, the particular uh, of any given uh, state. So our goal is then, can we use the uh, single cell profile measurements to recover these uh, constituent uh, cell states? And, and this algorithm unfortunately doesn't work when it comes to ataxic data and really um, is biased heavily by uh, regions of uh, high and low density. Um, um, so we took an alternative approach, this was work through to graduate students in my postdoctoral lab, where we are using really archetypal analysis to identify uh, these metacells or cell states that can help describe the system. Uh, and I'm gonna skip past this because we lost some time in the beginning, but uh, basically uh, what we do is we first construct a cell by cell affinity or a kernel matrix, and then apply our archetypal analysis on, on this kernel matrix to be able to really recover these groups of cells that are most likely a result of measurement noise from a constituent uh, cell state. And once we do this, we get a much nicer uh, recovery of the cell states. So this is the same, uh, just a quick example I showed where uh, the previous algorithm really didn't uh, work well at all, but then we can really recover these constituent uh, cell states very clearly um, through the system, uh, through, that, uh, through our algorithm. And sorry, and just to kind of quick, I'll skip past this, sorry. Uh, finish it up, I just want to say, um, I hope I gave you a bit of flavor of um, kind of the general research interest in my lab is really using these emerging technologies. I talked mostly about single cell RNA-C, a little bit of single cell ataxy, but there's a huge amount of technological advances also through spatial transcriptomics where you can measure the RNA uh, or now even multiple measurements in space and, and use these uh, to uh, in, build algorithms that can integrate these types of different types of data to be able to characterize these development trajectories. Um, and, and we are interested not, not one in kind of describing these developmental trajectories, but also really going deep and understanding what are the mechanisms that drive these uh, trajectories? As I mentioned, we are interested in understanding uh, uh, the cell autonomous regulatory networks and also perhaps uh, the cell communication mechanisms where how cells are interacting with each other to be able to drive these uh, trajectories. And then finally, we are very interested in understanding how uh, and the, what are the mechanisms in through which these things go wrong in disease. Uh, particularly, uh, we're looking at model systems where we can induce disease, right? If it's a mouse model system, 
we can first create a very uh, organized or uh, robust healthy reference of healthy reference trajectories and then induce disease and understand where exactly are things going wrong and how do things go wrong in disease. So this is something which we are uh, actively working on as well. Uh, so I want to finish by acknowledging my postdoctoral advisor, Dana Fair, and, and uh, our amazing collaborator, Kat Hachantanakis. This was all work, uh, well, the first part of was all work which was done in my uh, postdoctoral lab at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, I'm now at the Fred Pratt. Um, I started my lab about three months ago. And if you're interested in this kind of work, please feel free to uh, reach out to me. I'm happy to talk more. And yeah, thanks for this opportunity and I'm happy to take any uh, questions at this point. Brilliant. Thank you, Manu. That was great. Um, we have one question already in the chat. Uh -huh. um, so uh, that's from uh, Veronica. Uh, I can ask it for Veronica, but you might you might want to uh, turn your video on in case I in case I murdered the question. Um, what does plasticity look like in pseudo time, and how can it be distinguished from single cell gene expression noise? Right. No, that's a that's a very good question. So, um, in terms of the plasticity trend, initially, uh, I I wish I had the plot, but I'll make an effort to describe. But initially, you will have. Uh, plasticity kind of very constant at the beginning, and then it tends to drop drop down. Uh, so, so that's how uh, it, it, it's not a perfect correlation with the pseudotype, but there are, there are a series of steps, I guess the cells have go through before they can enter into the differentiation phase. And then there is a rapid drop down as cells commit to uh, different lineages. Um, so it's it's a approximately monotonous relationship, but it's not a perfectly correlation because there is a, a distinct lags of where the system can behave. And I'm happy to connect later so that I can show you the plot we described. Um, and how can it be distinguished from single cell gene expression noise? Now, that's a really good question too. Uh, I think the measurement of indi uh, any individual gene is probably quite an unreliable measure of our description of the system. But, but what works in our favor in this case, because we are measuring, we, are measure, we, are ha we measure things geno uh, transcriptome wide, there's a lot of covariate structure amongst these different genes or features. A lot of the genes tend to be correlated. Therefore, we can really take advantage of the fact that genes really behave in modules where groups of genes uh, show very similar behavior. And that is what gives us a robust signal to be able to either get a pseudo time order or, or these potential. Uh, but once we have that, we can use the ordering to define a trend of the expression. Um, yeah, so really it, any individual gene can be very noisy, but we can really take advantage of the fact that there is this strong correlation effect to model these systems. That's how we overcome the noise. Brilliant, thanks. Is there any other questions? Uh, Carol. Yeah, hi. Um, so I, I, I thank you very much for your talk. And, and I like very much uh, single cell RNA-seq and, and I do believe that uh, changes during, during differentiation are, are, are continuous. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, um, I, I, I'm worried to, that we extrapolate too much Mm -hmm. from RNA sequencing data. Um, mm -hmm. For the cell, the RNA is just, is just there. The, 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 the guy who is doing the job is a protein. Right. Um, and, and so there might be discrete states mm -hmm. that the cells is able to read that we view as continuous when we look at RNA-seq data. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I, I, do you have any, any, any sort of thought of how to... to uh, um, uh, address this, this issue. Yeah, no, that's, uh, it's, uh, you, you make a very important legitimate point. And in many ways, we use this RNA as a proxy for cell state because we can reliably measure it, right? So it's more of a convenience. But, but one thing I will, uh, uh, I, I think one point I want to make here is, even though we are saying uh, things are continuous, right? 
So the, if you look at the density, and, and even this is in high dimensions as well, uh, the density tends to be highly non-uniform in nature. So, uh, so, so what that means is that uh, there are clearly, we can observe regions of low density and that could be potentially uh, things like checkpoints where the cells are really moving rapidly to their next state but then I'm really losing their ability to go back to the previous state. And I think what, when we talk about this continuous meaning is previously when people thought of these cell types, you could see there are large scale differences from one step to the other. Uh, and then what this data and general this suggests is, uh, yeah, so the, the changes tend to be more gradual in nature, right? So it's not like uh, from one point to another point, there are like thousands of genes that just change simultaneously, that there, there are uh, more graded changes. In terms of how it impacts, uh, how much we are over interpreting the RNA versus the protein, I think unfortunately that's something, uh, it's a bit tricky, but one thing that tracks well is that uh, many of the transcription factor expressions tend to be highly dynamic in nature, and those uh, really inform, so for example, if you have a transcription factor one going up, then that is followed by the targets going up, even at the expression level with a little bit of a time lag. So you can really view this the process as waves of different groups of genes coming on, and that waves of gene expression is what kind of creates this uh, continuous manner rather than all of the genes kind of coming on together. And then given that tight regulation, maybe there is, uh, it's already informative, although uh, without the protein, it might be hard to say, but just the fact that there are these very clear groups of genes that come on one after the other at the expression level does seem to suggest there is uh, value or biological meaning uh, to the extent of continuity we see in the data. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, thanks, Bob. Yeah, yes, thanks. Okay, great. Great, any other questions, Mirza? Um, I don't think they, um, if, if none, then I can ask. <laughs> okay, um, uh, thank you very much, Manu. Great talk. Sorry for the, di the disturbance for Zoom. <laughs> oh, no, that's, I don't even know what's going on. Thanks for the opportunity. Of so this, the last bit you presented, though, the multi ohm uh -huh. Is there any work there are you seen? Are you, you, you are working on any of this, like I, this similar idea to how many are, I'm not actually very palantir uh -huh. on, on the multi ohm because you have the same cell and then you have two potentials, right? <laughs> no, that's like that. Uh, that, that yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is uh, something we are getting going as well. I mean, the point when we got this multi ohm, we wanted to jump right into it and trying to do Palantir style modeling of how uh, one can inform the other and how we can model to get something unified, right? But then the data was so noisy, we had to build some uh, additional algorithm that's the meta cell uh, algorithm to identify these states. But now we are starting to do some exploration. It's not, I guess, it's still quite preliminary. But when you see this, you if you see the uh, trends of these probabilities, they can be quite different between attack and RNA. And in fact, when we look at the attack, many of the times the, the, the cells acquire these probabilities much earlier in pseudo time compared to what we can see in RNA. There, there was this paper last uh, in the bioarchive from the Ragev's group about the chromatic yeah, exactly. potential. So that's what. That's exactly right. So, right, that, that's the shared seek paper. And we are trying to do something more uh, systematic here where we can compute these probabilities and we can compute these probabilities across multiple lineages as well and compare them. And, and we do see repeatedly across these different lineages, we can see the de detect the uh, self fate commitment uh, happening much earlier in attack compared to RNA. And hopefully in a few months time, I can have a more concrete story around it. Yeah, but that's really what something we are actively working on. Now. Maybe another yeah. talk from you in near, in future. I hope so, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we can stay a few minutes. If somebody else have any question, please do ask them. Yeah, 
I'll, I'll stop the recording now anyway, because I think that uh, um, it's good. And uh, yeah, feel free.